Good evening and welcome to all. Tonight's class is graciously dedicated in tribute to Ida Schattenstein with much appreciation and respect by her husband, David Schattenstein. Thank you very much and God bless you. You know, they say that in Jewish restaurants, in kosher restaurants, the waiter goes around from table to table and asks this question at every table. Is anything all right? And so this evening, we will discuss the unique menu, which according to Jewish tradition is eaten during the holiday of Shavuos, which we will celebrate at the end of this week. It is an ancient Jewish custom and tradition that on the Yom Tif, on the holiday of Shavuos, we eat milchiks. We don't only enjoy a fleshika meal, a deli meal, but before that, we first eat ma'achalei chalav, dairy foods, food of milk, food made from milk, and then we wait, and following that, we eat the regular holiday fleshik meal, deli meal. What is the reason for this custom, for this tradition, which has taken root in Jewish communities the world over? And today, if you go to a Jewish home on Shavuos, often they have the best and most delicious gourmet dairy dishes, whether it's cheesecakes and cheese blintzes and different types of lasagnas and cheese knishes and berekeses and so on and so forth. Each home according to their uh, capabilities and taste. What is the reason for this custom and tradition? So there are many reasons that are given. One famous one is the one presented in the Mishnah Brura, and you have it in your curriculum right under the video, source number one. The Mishnah Brura quotes a God Echad, a great sage, who gave the following explanation. When the Torah was given, the day of Matan Torah, after the Torah was given, the Jews did not have the patience or the energy to go bother and slaughter animals and prepare new deli food. On the other hand, they couldn't eat the flesh of food, the meat food from previous days. Why? Because it was prepared before the Torah was given, not according to the kosher dietary laws, so they couldn't eat the old meat. Knew they didn't want to prepare. I guess they were very exhausted and overwhelmed, and they didn't have the energy to now go and prepare food from the beginning, slaughter the animal, and then go salt the meat and get rid of the blood, and then cook it and so forth. So the simplest thing was to eat milchika food to eat dairy food on the day the Torah was given, and that's why we perpetuate that tradition in our own lives every holiday of Shavuos. Rabbi Shlomo Yosef Zevin in his book Hamoad and Bahalacha adds an extra insight. He says it's not just they didn't want to go through the bother, technically, practically, but furthermore, the Talmud tells us, the Gemara says in Tractate Shabbos, Lekula Alma B'Shabbos Nitna Torah. According to all opinions, the Torah was given on Shabbos. Shechita, to slaughter an animal, is prohibited on Shabbos. In fact, it's one of the 39 prototypes of labor. Forbidden on Shabbos is shechita, is to slaughter an animal. So they could not prepare new fleshik of food, meat, on Shabbos. They could also not use, again, the old meat, as we said, because those, that was prepared not according to the laws of Kashrut. It was before the Torah was given. The vessels were also tray for vessels, non-kosher vessels, and therefore they ate, they ate new food, they ate milchika food, dairy food. This is one of the famous reasons presented why we have this custom of eating milchiks on Shavuos. And there are other reasons that are given. But tonight, I want to pre present another possible explanation for this based 
on an insight articulated in the works of Jewish mysticism and spirituality, Kabbalah and Hasidus. And for this, we have to embark on a journey into the first meal and feast discussed in Chumash. And of course, it's the lavish meal that Avraham Avinu, Abraham our father, presents to the three guests who later turn out to be angels who come visit him in the portion of Ayer in the book of Bereshus. If you look in your curriculum, the Torah presents to us the exact menu, what Avraham gave his guest that day when they came to his tent on that hot summer day to eat. And verse number 7, Pasuk Zion, Vel habaka rots Avraham. Abraham ran to the cattle. Vayikach ben baka rach v'toiv. He took a tender and fresh calf, good calf. Vayitin al anar vayemar lasasoyse. He gave it to the lad who hastened to prepare it. Next verse, pasuk ches. Vayikach chema v'cholav. He took cottage cheese and milk. Uven habakur asher osa and the calf that he had prepared, vayitain lifneim and he placed these foods before them, before the angels. Vu emed aleim tachas aets. He was standing over them under the tree vayechelu and they ate. Essentially, our meal on Shavuos, we first eat dairy foods, milchika foods, cottage cheese, milk followed by the fleshika meal, by the meal of Delhi, mimics this first meal in Chumash, the way Avraham Avinu fed his guests. Now, by the way, I translated Chema as cottage cheese. This is the translation in the Living Torah by Rabbi Ari Kaplan. There are other translations. Chema as cream, or butter, or a certain type of yogurt, but in any case, it's a dairy food which comes from milk, whether it's cottage cheese, cheese, or cream, or butter, or yogurt. So Avram Avinu takes cottage cheese, milk, also the meat, and he gives it to them, and they eat it. Sounds like a cheeseburger with a cappuccino. Indeed, Around 400 years later, God refuses to give the Torah to the angels because according to God, they ate non-kosher food when they were by Abraham. And here we are exposed to a fascinating medrash in your curriculum. Medrash Tehillim Mizmer Ches, a medrash on the book of Tehillim, section 8. Let's read it. When Moses went up to the mountain to receive the tablets a second time after the first tablets which were broken, Amru Malachi Asharis, the angel said, Master of the universe, Why are you repeating your mistake and giving the Torah again to the Jewish people just yesterday? They violated the Torah. The Torah says, don't create any other gods. And they went and worshipped the golden calf. Why repeat the mistake and give them the Torah? Amar lahem HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God responds to the angels. B'chal yoyim ayisim kategorim b'ni l'ben Yisrael. Every day you find another way how to create antagonism between me and the Jewish people. Is it not true that when you descended from heaven and you went to Abraham, you ate meat together with milk? He gave you cream or cheese and milk and meat and you ate it. Their child, when he comes from the house of his teacher, from the yeshiva, from the school, and his mother wants to give him food, and his mother serves him bread and meat and cheese to eat, 
and the child tells his mother, today, mommy, my teacher taught me, do not cook a calf in the milk of its mother. Do not eat meat together with milk. The angels could not find a response, an answer. God challenges them. You are telling me don't give the Torah to the Jewish people because yesterday they violated the Torah. Let me ask you, Malachim, when you came down to Abraham, what did you do? You ate meat and milk. You ate fleshics and milkics together. He served you butter or cottage cheese and milk together with meat, and you ate. Their children come home from school and refuse to eat the two foods mixed together. And they didn't have a response. That moment Hashem, God tells Moses, Write down these words, as long as they don't have a response, as long as they don't have an answer. And what the Midrash is referring to in this last moment is a fascinating concept. If you look in the next source in your curriculum, there is a verse in, in Exodus, Kisisa, the portion of Kisisa, chapter 34, verses 26 and 27, Chavav and Chavzayin, the Torah says, don't cook a goat in the milk of its mother, the source for the prohibition of cooking meat and milk. Hashem, God tells Moshe, Moses, Write down these words, because based on these words, I made a covenant with you and the Jewish people. What is the meaning, write down these words, which words? So the Medrash is saying, what Hashem is saying is, write down these above mentioned words. Do not cook a goat in the milk of its mother, because based on these words, I made a covenant with you and the Jewish people. What is the connection? But according to this episode, we understand the connection very well. If there would have not been a prohibition not to eat meat with milk, God would not be able to make a covenant with the Jewish people because the angels would have a great question and they would raise a great problem. How are you giving the Torah to people who violated it and will probably violate it in the future? But since there's a prohibition, don't cook a goat in the milk of its mother, and the angels violated that prohibition. So based on these words, I made the covenant with you and Israel. So write it down. Write down these words. They're critical. In their merit, you and the Jewish people receive the Torah. This medrash is also quoted in Das Kein Mebali Toisvis. The commentary, the commentary of Toisvis on Chumash in Vayera. And you have it here in your curriculum. Melamed Shachilam Basar V'cholov. We see that Avram fed them meat and milk. When God wanted to give the Torah to Israel, the angel said, give your grace to, leave your grace in heaven. God tells them, The Torah prohibits the eating of meat and milk together, but when you came down to earth, you ate meat and milk. The angels immediately conceded to God. Here is, of course, the great question. Hashem is accusing the angels of eating meat and milk. Violating the commandment in the Torah, do not eat meat with milk. But if we follow the story, in Vayera we see they did not eat meat followed by milk. They drank milk and subsequently they ate meat. Halachically, according to Torah, there's no problem with that. Take a look in your curriculum, Shulchan Aruch, Yeridea, Simon Petas. The Code of Jewish Law, the section of Yeridea, section 89. Ochal basar, if you eat meat. Layoichal gvina acherav Don't eat cheese afterwards until you wait six hours. Between meat and milk, between fleshiks and milchiks, we wait six hours. So you had a good Shabbos challenge with meat. Come Saturday night, you want to eat pizza? You have to look. If six hours passed, go eat pizza and ice cream. If six hours did not pass, wait till six hours pass, and then you can eat cheese or any food that comes from dairy, food from dairy, dairy products. 
Siv Beis, the second section in that part of Shulchan Aruch, in that simon, in that section, 89. Ochal Gvina, what if you ate cheese? Mutter lechel acher of basam yad. Immediately after the cheese, you can eat meat. You have to check your hands, there should be no part of the cheese stuck. You have to wipe your mouth and rinse your mouth to get rid of the cheese before you go eat meat. But you don't have to wait. You can immediately eat cheese. Yes, the minig in Ashkenaz, the custom in Ashkenaz was to wait. Some people are half an hour and others an hour, a full hour, which is the custom in many communities till today that after you eat a dairy product, you wait an hour until you eat meat. This is also what the Zohar, it's based on the Zohar in a portion of Mishpatim, as discussed in the commentators on Shulchan Aruch in Yeridea, section 89, Simon Peites. Tops an hour, and then you could eat meat products. Now, come back to the original source where the Torah discusses the menu which Avram Avinu served his guests, the angels. Vayikachema, he took cottage cheese, v'cholov, and milk, uvena bakor asher osa, and the calf which he prepared, and he gave it to them. What did he give them first? It doesn't say he gave them the meat, and then he gave them cottage cheese and milk. First he gave them cottage cheese, or cream, or yogurt, or butter, and he gave them milk, and then he gave them the meat. So first they ate dairy, and then they ate deli. Halachically, there's no problem with that. Furthermore, the Torah says he gave them cottage cheese, he gave them milk, he took cottage cheese and milk, and the calf which he prepared. The two words which he prepared, asher asa, seem superfluous. Obviously he prepared it. The verse before that tells us that he gave it to the lad to prepare it. Obviously he prepared it. If you don't prepare it, you can't serve it. So what does Rashi explain? Rashi on the verse explains that Avram Avinu didn't bring out all the food simultaneously. As a product was ready, as a dish was ready, he immediately brought it out. So whatever he had immediately, he served, and then he prepared more food, and when that was ready, he brought that out as well. As in the real restaurant, you sit down, they give you what's ready, some bread or some dips, and then as they prepare your dish, they bring it out. Avram Avinu had a great restaurant, the first restaurant recorded in Chumash. In his own home, in his own tent. So that's why it says he took cottage cheese, he took milk, and the calf which he prepared. In other words, he went to prepare it. In the meantime, they were eating the cottage cheese and the milk. How long does it take to prepare a calf? So it has to be slaughtered. It has to be prepared. It has to be cooked. Or barbecued, or satayed, or however Avram Avinu prepared it. How long does that take? Minimum an hour. Certainly a half an hour. So not only, not only did they not eat flesheks, meat, right after they ate the milk, as the Shulchan Aruch allows, but they waited a half an hour, an hour, as the Zoyar says. And the Minig in Ashkenaz, the custom in many communities of Ashkenaz, the Ashkenazi custom. So it was a Mahadrim, Minna Mahadrim, glad kosher meal. The most ultra-Orthodox rabbis who would supervise that restaurant would say, glat kosher, no problem. This was a perfectly kosher legal meal according to all halachic standards, even the most stringent standards of kosher, of eating kosher. Comes now history a few hundred years later, and when the angels are telling God, don't trust the Jews... They transgressed yesterday, they will transgress tomorrow. Hashem says, they're transgressing, how about you? You violated the Torah, you ate goat, you ate the goat in the milk of its mother. That's not the case. They first drank milk, and then an hour later, or whatever the time that passed, they ate flesh, they ate meat. Indeed, the Das Kena Mebali Atosfus continues and brings a second of Madrish that they did not transgress this prohibition because first was meat, milk, and then was the meat. But the question is, how does the Madrish Tehillim and the first opinion of the Das Kena even entertain the idea that the angels violated here the Isra, the prohibition known as Basa of meat and milk when it doesn't seem to be the case? 
The question continues. It seems strange. Why would the angels violate the prohibition of eating meat together with milk? And what is this, some type of game? The angels are telling God, don't give the Torah to, the earth, to earth. The Jewish people are not responsible. They will not hold it dear. They will transgress the mitzvot, the commandments of the Torah. What is God's response to them? You don't talk. You were worse. You also violated the Torah. Is this a logical response? Is this just trying to keep them quiet? Is there some depth or logic to the response? And why did Avraham Avinu, Abraham, the rabbis say that Avraham Avinu observed the mitzvahs even before they were given. Why did he put them in this position? Why did he serve a non-kosher meal to his guests? And tonight, I want to present to you a fascinating explanation presented by the Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Schneir Zalman of Liadi, the famous author of Tanya, of Shulchan Aruch, the founder of Chabad, who prefaces his explanation by first presenting the deeper mystical, spiritual and emotional reason for the halachic difference between meat and milk. That once you eat meat, you have to wait six hours till you drink milk or eat other dairy products. But if you consume dairy products, you need not wait six hours to eat deli products. Why the difference? Generally, in the literature of Jewish law halacha, there are the two famous reasons. The reason of the Rambam of Maimonides, Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, and the reason of the tour from his father, and, and the, reason from the, the reason of the tour. Who actually quotes from his father, the Rosh, Rabbi Asher. And you have it in your sources. Sif Sekohen, Yeridea Simen Peites, Sif Cotton Beis. Both the Shach and the Taz both present both reasons in Yeridea and Shachon Aruch Simen Peites. But let's quote the Shach, Sif Sekohen. The Shach writes like this. Zeloshen Hatur. This is what the Torah says. Why after eating meat do you have to wait six hours till you can eat cheese? So he says, Lefi shahabasar moitzi shuman umoishich tam adzman aruch. The residue of the fat of the meat lingers in the mouth for a long time. In other words, when you eat fleshiks, when you eat meat, steak, and so forth, it is so fatty, there's so much shuman. It's so rich and fatty that the taste continues to linger in one's mouth, in one's palate, in one's throat for a long time. Estimated six hour, approximately six hours. So we wait six hours till we're certain that the taste is gone, and now we can consume cheese. The other way around, it's not a problem. V'harambam nasantam l'shihiyam ishum basar shabayin ashenayim. The Rambam, Maimonides, gave a reason because meat often gets stuck between the teeth and therefore we wait six hours until we're sure the, te- the meat the, the, is usually out of the teeth, it's not stuck anymore, now you can eat cheese. We embrace both of these reasons, which means practically speaking that even after six hours if there's still meat stuck in your teeth, you have to take it out before you eat cheese. And conversely, even if nothing got stuck, if you're sure nothing got stuck, you have to wait six hours because of the lingering taste. Here is an interesting story on a side note. The Chsam Seifer, the famous halachic authority, Rabbi Moshe Seifer, Rabbi Moshe Schreiber, the rabbi of Preshburg, today it's Bratislava, he gave another explanation. The Chsam Seifer felt that the reason you have to wait six hours after meat is because of digestion. He felt that it takes the human system six hours to digest meat. And based on this, the Chsam Seifer came up with a novel halachic idea, namely, since when a person sleeps, 
his or her digestive system works much swifter. So therefore, if you eat meat and you go to sleep and you have a normal night's sleep, even though you did not sleep for six hours, when you wake up in the morning, you can eat milchiks. Why? Because it's based on digestion, and when you sleep, the digestion works much faster, much more efficient, so therefore you don't have to wait six hours if you had a normal night's sleep. Once, there's a story that some cipher ate meat at night. He went to sleep afterwards. He slept for a few hours, less than six hours. He woke up in the morning, and he prepared himself a coffee. Based on his halachic innovation, that you don't have to wait six hours if you slept in the interim. And the story is told, he had the coffee on the table, so he had the coffee, and he had the hot water, and he had milk, and six hours did not pass. And a child... I guess, woke up and came running into the kitchen or wherever the Chesam Seifer was sitting and hit the table and the coffee spilled out. And the Chesam Seifer said that this was a simon mil maila. This was a sign from heaven that they did not agree with his halachic verdict. And he went back to the mainstream halachic verdict in Shulchan Aruch and in the commentaries that after meat you wait six hours no matter if you slept in the middle or it's the middle of the day you didn't sleep. These are the two practical halachic reasons for why we wait after meat six hours and after cheese we don't wait six hours. But now let's discuss the mystical or spiritual meaning. As we know, every single food in the world, like every existence in the world, every physical substance in the world represents a spiritual form of energy. In Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism, dairy products are associated with the attribute of chesed, love. Deli products reflect the attribute of gvura, strength. The serene whiteness of milk, and it being a substance that, unlike a salad, flows and expands readily, are physical features reflecting the emotional energy flow of love, of kindness, of tender nurturing. There's something else about milk that makes it uniquely reflective of the energy of chesed. It's the only physical substance in the world that the more the mother gives to her child, the more she gets. Usually with physicality, the more I shear, the less I have. If I have $100 and I give those $100 to you, they went over to you, and they're not by me anymore. I write out a check, that money leaves my account and goes into your account. I give you something physical, a gift, it leaves my domain and enters into your domain. That's the rule of the game. And spirituality is the other way around. If I share wisdom, the more I share, the deeper I get it, the deeper I understand it, the more I get out of it. But that's only in spirituality. In physicality, in most substances, you share it, you lose it. Milk is one of the unique exceptions. Fire as well. Namely, we see practically the way God created the biological system. The more the mother gives milk to the nursing child, the more she acquires milk in her own system. And that's what chesed is, that's what love is. When you give love, you get much more love. And you grow much more. By sharing By transcending your own ego and giving to somebody else, you get that much more. So milk, because of its color, because of the nature of it being a liquid, because of the above-mentioned quality, the more you give, the more you get, is associated in Kabbalah with the energy of chesed love. The redness and toughness of meat, on the other hand, are reflections of man's capacity for gvura, for strength, to create boundaries and walls, to discipline, to withhold, to reject, to say no. The color of meat, the red color of meat, which is also associated with fire and gvura, the toughness of meat, the texture of meat, these are features reflecting the spiritual energy of gvura. Chesed and gvura, love and strength, are two polar emotions that are necessary for a life, for a functional and healthy life. Gvura is not cruel. It's an important component in a relationship. If there's only love and there's no borders, if there's only giving and there's no reciprocity, 
if there's only generosity and there are no consequences, we're denying the person whom we love the ability to develop their independence. If love eliminates the gulf between people, the love can be choking and ultimately deny the dignity and the respect the other person needs. Borders, gvura underscores the space we give each other. It recognizes the distinctiveness and the otherness of the beloved one. There is a great line of the Kotzke Rebbe in Yiddish. Ich bin ich, weil du bist du. Und du bist du, weil ich bin ich. Bin ich nicht ich, und du bist nicht du. Aber ich bin ich, weil ich bin ich. Und du bist du, weil du bist du. Bin ich ich, und du bist du. If I am I because you are you, and you are you because I am I, then I am not I, and you are not you. But if I am I because I am I, and you are you because you are you, then I am I, and you are you. And now we can begin to argue. This was my addition, these last few words. Meaning, if there's only chesed in my life, if I am I only because you are you, then I am not I and you are not you. There is an I and there is a you. And that's what Gvura underscores. And then there could be a relationship between the two. In life, one has to be able to say yes, but one also has to be able to say no. In fact, if you never say no, you never really say yes. Yet, Although both elements are crucial in order to maintain a healthy balance in life, the attribute of chesed must always overpower and dominate the attribute of gvura. One needs to make sure that his acts of disciplining are an outgrowth of love and caring rather than the other way around. Parents, for example. Parents must have chesed love and nurture children, express the love and so forth. They also need gvura, they have to discipline, rebuke their children, create consequences. But the parent's primary enjoyment ought to come from nurturing and creating close relationships with their children, not from constructing boundaries and punishing them. On the contrary, if you penalize your child not as an expression of chesed, not because you love them, but because you're angry and you're frustrated and you feel alien from them, it's destructive more than constructive. And the same is true in education. A good educator and teacher must employ chesed and must employ gvura. If there is no gvura, then often the classroom becomes a jungle. There is no growth, there's no consistency, there's no trust, there's no discipline, and ultimately the children don't respect themselves. But what must be the power overpowering attribute? Chesed, the love, the nurture, the kindness, the grace. Discipline is a means to create a healthy love, to create love that helps build people rather than love that spoils and ultimately diminishes people. But love must be more dominant than discipline. Both are critical, both are important, both are vital. But the chesed must be more powerful than the gvura. Now, we come to another very interesting concept in Jewish law known as Tata Gavar, the lower one dominates. And this is actually an argument in Gemara. In your curriculums, under the video, you can open up, there's an, quoted the Talmud in Psachim. Mesech the Psachim, the Fayin Vava Medal of Tractate Psachim, page 76. Cham le toich tzoinen, ve tzoinen le toich The Talmud asks a question like this. We know that heat allows the taste absorbed in one food to travel to the food nearby in the same path. Scientifically, heat, of course, causes the molecules to open up, and therefore the substance and taste in one food is absorbed by the dish, by the food near it. Cold foods don't transfer the taste from one to another as the molecules remain closed. So, if 
a hot piece of meat falls in to a hot bowl of milk. There is no question that the meat and the milk here get mixed up, even if you take the milk out of the, out of the pot, or you take the meat out of the pot, since they're both hot, so the taste was transferred, so both of them are prohibited. If cold food falls into cold food, and one is kosher and one is not kosher, the taste is not transferred and they remain kosher. The question is, what happens if hot food falls into cold food? Or cold food falls into hot food? Rav Omar Rav says, The upper substance dominates. Shmuel is of the opinion that the lower substance, the lower food dominates. So if you have a pot and a piece of kosher food and a piece of, of non-kosher food are both in the pot. One is hot and one is cold. So Rav says, you have to look on the ilah, the higher food. It dominates. If the higher food is hot, it heats up the lower food before the lower food manages to cool off the higher food. And since it heats up everything in the pot, so the tastes are transferred, and there's non-kosher food here, everything is forbidden. Shmuel says, no, tata govar. The lower food dominates. The lower food overpowers. So if the lower food is hot, if the lower substance is hot, it heats off the higher piece before the higher one manages to cool off the lower one, and therefore the taste is transferred and everything is non-kosher. But according to Shmuel, if the lower piece of food is cold, it cools off the higher as well, and the food is not transferred. So you have to peel off the part of the kosher food which is touching the non-kosher food, but the whole remainder of the kosher food remains kosher for Jewish consumption because the lower piece was cold and it cools off the pot. Rav is of the opinion that the higher piece dominates. This is the argument. What is the halacha? What is Jewish law? Like Shmuel. As Rashi brings there, the halacha here is like Shmuel, that tata gavar, the lower food dominates. And that's the halachin, your next source, your day is Simon Sadiq Aleph, Siv Dalit. Basar v'chol of roitchin shenasar v'yachat. Hot meat and milk which got mixed in to a pot. Afilu basar tsoinin l'toy chol of roitayach, oi chol of tsoinin l'toy basar roitayach, hakalos. Or even cold meat fell into hot milk. Or cold milk fell into hot meat. Hakel asur mishum de tata gavar. Everything is forbidden because the lower substance prevails. And since the lower substance, whether it was the milk, was hot, or whether it was the meat, if the meat is on the bottom, was cold, was hot. So therefore, everything is prohibited. Tata gavar, the lower one dominates. According to this, says the Alter Rebbe, we can understand the deeper spiritual and emotional reason why after meat you have to wait six hours till you drink milk, but after drinking milk you don't have to wait before eating meat. The difference is based on understanding the contrast we spoke about, chesed versus gvura. Whatever I eat first becomes the foundation. It becomes the tata, the foundation which dominates the food which comes subsequently afterwards. Says the Alter Rebbe, if I drank milk, or I ate ice cream, or pizza, or something else which is of a dairy product, so what's the tata, what's in the foundation of my system? Chesed, because dairy products reflect the energy of love. Now if afterwards, immediately afterwards, I wash my hands, I rinse my mouth, I wait a half an hour, I wait an hour, and I now eat meat. The meat is ilah. The meat came on top of the milk. The gvura is now subservient to the chesed. Because tata, gavar, the lower substance prevails, the foundation prevails, what's on the bottom triumphs and dominates and overpowers. So the chesed dominates over the gvura. The dairy overpowers the deli. Because the dairy came first, it's on the bottom. Tata, gavar, the lower substance prevails. Granted, good. 
But if it's the other way around, if you first eat a piece of steak or a piece of chicken, so now what is absorbed in your system first? Gvura, the energy of rejection, of strength, of discipline. Now, if you're going to immediately eat a dairy product, the chesed will become subservient to the gvura in life. That's not how it should be. The chesed always has to be a little more powerful than the gvura. There has to be what the Kabbalah calls, Hasidus calls, tegbeides ha-chasadim al ha The overpowering of love over discipline and strength. So if a person absorbs meat first, the energy of rejection becomes the bottom substance in the body. So that if the person would consume dairy immediately afterwards, the attribute of rejection would overpower the attribute of love in his life. Based on the principle that the bottom overpowers the top. And what's the bottom? Meat, gvura. Only when six hours have elapsed, during which the rejection energy of meat is fully digested in his system, and there is no residue of meat left in the throat, in the palate, between the teeth, as the Rambam explained it halachically, and there is no taste of the meat lingering as the Torah explained it halachically, spiritually what it means, the gvura is now not dominating your system, now you can digest, you can internalize the dairy energy of love in a healthy, productive, and constructive manner. But if a person consumes dairy first, so the flow of chesed is the bottom substance, so then he can immediately proceed to eat meat. Because in this case, the prevailing substance would be chesed, and it would dominate the power of gvura that becomes second. So the next time you eat meat and you have to wait six hours till you could consume dairy, remember it's not just a technical halachic process it's also a deep psychological emotional and spiritual cleansing process your chesed cannot afford to become subservient to your gvura first cleanse the system wait six hours cleanse the gvura and then introduce the milk introduce the chesed practically speaking what it means in our own personal application when a person is angry or frustrated, or you feel distant from the person you're dealing with. That's not the moment to chastise them. It's not the moment to rebuke them. It's not the moment to criticize them. If you don't love this child now, don't penalize him or her, because the penalty will be usually counterproductive. If you're very angry at your spouse, do not criticize them. It will only make them more defensive. You must make sure the chesed is prevailing, the chesed is dominant, and then the criticism will be listened to and consumed in a different fashion altogether. Why did God establish the natural law that the bottom substance overpowers the higher substance. Why is the halacha, the law that tata govern, the lower substance prevails and dominates? Why? You may say, Shmuel believes, those are the facts. The lower substance will have a greater impact on the pot. But that itself is always a reflection of a spiritual truth, which then evolves within the physical world. So the Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Shnei Zalman of Liadi, explains, the reason Tata Gavar, the lower substance, prevails is because in the cosmic battle between heaven and earth, the bottom prevailed over heaven, which is the top. When did earth prevail over heaven? It was that moment discussed in the beginning of the class. When the angels, the heavenly creatures populating the spiritual universe on high, demanded that the Torah be granted to them. They tell God, bestow your grace on heaven. But it was earth that triumphed. Our rock bottom world a world which is lowly and coarse, 
a world in which the divine presence is almost completely, if not completely, eclipsed and concealed. This world became the recipient of Torah, of the divine blueprint for life. It is on our soil and within our frail hearts that the objective of all creation is implemented. The bottom indeed overpowered the top. The angel said, keep the Torah in heaven. Let the higher world prevail. Let Elah govar. Let the supernal spiritual realities triumph. But the, the result in practicality was Tata govar. The lower one prevails. You know, they tell the anecdote about a rabbi who used to always preach about how you have to love children and be nice to children and be warm to children and nurture children. And he always spoke about how sensitive he is to children. And once they were paving his alleyway. They were paved it with new cement, new plaster. And of course, children see fresh cement. They immediately, from the whole block, came dancing over the pavement, the fresh pavement, jumping on it, making their mark, their imprints physically in the new concrete. And the rabbi sees what's happening and he comes out to the porch and he begins yelling and hollering at the kids. And his wife hears her husband hollering. She comes out and she says... You always talk about how you have to be sensitive to children and love children and be nice to children. Why are you hollering at them with such anger? And he tells his wife, he says, I love children in the ideal, not in the concrete. There are two worlds. There's the ideal world and there's the concrete world. So the angel said, let Elah govar. Let the higher worlds prevail. Let the Torah be given to heaven. But earth triumphed. Sinai happened here on this planet. The Torah was given to human beings living a soul in a frail body with a frail heart. Mortal human beings who live in a lowly and coarse world which eclipses spirituality and godliness. This is where the Torah was given. Now we will be able to understand the true depth of that conversation, that fateful exchange between God and the angels, that moment when he was about to give Moses the second tablets. Let's remember, why Tata Gavar? Why does the lower prevail? Because it reflects the cosmic truth. Earth prevailed over heaven. If the Torah would have been given in heaven, Elah Gavar, it means the higher worlds prevailed over the lower world. Now, the angels come to God and say, don't give the Torah to the Jewish people. They violated it. They transgressed it. Don't trust them with your deepest treasure. Don't trust them with that which is your most intimate love, the Torah. So God responds and says, I don't understand. You're accusing the Jews. When you went to Avram Avinu, you violated the Torah. You ate meat and milk. It's prohibited. You're the ones who reject the Torah. You're the ones who show disrespect to Torah and mitzvahs. Now you're blaming the Jews and you want the Torah for yourself? So the angels ought to respond, as we asked at the beginning of the class, what do you mean? We first drank milk, we first ate cottage cheese, and then we ate the burger. We first ate the cheese and then the burger. We first drank the milk and then we had the beef. Then we had the tongue and the mustard, which Avraham Avinu served them. What's the response to them? God says, no. According to your philosophy, according to your perspective, that Elah Gavar, that the Torah ought to, be, ought to remain in heaven, the Torah ought to be given to angels, in other words, the higher substance prevails, then if the higher substance prevails, then you're not allowed to eat meat after milk. You're only allowed to drink milk after meat, but you're not allowed to eat meat after milk. The reason we explained why you're allowed to consume meat after you have eaten dairy products is because tata gavar, the lower substance prevails. So when you drink milk, the chesed is on the bottom. Now when you eat meat, the higher substance is subservient to the lower substance. The gvur is subservient to the chesed. But if you believe that Elah Gavar, that the higher substance prevails because the Torah belongs in heaven, and that's the ultimate key 
which represents this contrast of philosophies, whether the ideal prevails or the concrete prevails, you say the Torah belongs in heaven, so then it would be the other way around. If you drink milk first, you cannot eat meat afterwards. Why? Because the higher prevails. If the higher prevails, so the chesed is subservient to the gvura. Only if you eat meat first, then can you drink milk afterwards because the higher prevails. So to put it in other words, what God was telling the angels is this. From the fact that when you visited Abraham, you ate milk after you drank milk and you ate meat after you drank milk and ate cottage cheese, this demonstrated that deep down you know the truth, that the Torah belongs on earth, not in heaven. Deep down you are intimately and keenly aware of the truth that tata govar, that the lower substance prevails, and therefore if you drink milk and eat cottage cheese, or yogurt, or cream first, afterwards you can consume meat. Why can you consume meat? Because tata govar, because the lower substance prevails, and therefore the gvura becomes subservient to the chesed, the discipline becomes subservient to the love, rather than the love becoming subservient to the discipline. So when the angels protested God's plan to send the Torah down to earth, demanding that it remains within the higher realms of existence, God is demonstrating to them that they really did not believe what they were saying. Because if they truly felt that the Torah belonged above and not below, it would mean that their perspective held that the top ought to overpower the bottom. And that's why the Torah belongs where? On top, in heaven. But if that were the case, they would need to wait six hours after eating cheese before they, they, cons- before they could consume meat. So that the rejection power of meat would not override the loving power of cheese. All this based on their perspective, of course, that the higher substance overpowers the lower substance. But the fact that the angels did consume meat immediately following their dairy meal, demonstrates that they too believed that the divine blueprint for life was reserved for the human race. The Torah was reserved for us human beings living and struggling and battling a lowly and mundane reality. They too conceded to the fact that the bottom overpowers the top. And that's why they allowed themselves to consume dairy and immediately after that eat deli. Thus, it was in the merit of the dairy followed by deli meal that the Torah was given to the Jewish people. According to this insight of the Alter Rebbe Rabbi Shneir Zalman of Liadi, in this Midrash and Parshas Vayera, we could now possibly appreciate and glean a whole new perspective on why on Shavuos, the day the Torah was given to the Jewish people. The tradition is, the custom is, that we reenact the Abrahamic feast. We eat dairy, we take a break, we wash our hands, we rinse our mouth, we wait for the allotted time that everybody waits, whatever you wait, and then we eat the deli. Why is this so significant? Because this demonstrates the truth that earth prevailed over heaven. We mimic and we replicate the first feast in Chumash. The first feast that Avram Avinu gave the angels. Deary followed by Delhi. What is the justification for that? Tata Gavar. The lower substance prevails. If the higher substance would prevail again, you couldn't eat Delhi after Deary. You can eat Deary after Delhi, not Delhi after Deary. Only because the lower substance prevails, the foundation prevails, the lower overpowers the higher, thus you can eat dairy, followed by deli. This expresses that great truth which was manifested on the holiday of Shavuos, that it's in our labor to sanctify the soil in our life where we touch the ultimate truth of existence. It's in our daily efforts to confront the concealment in this world and the concealment in our own psyche and reality, which eclipses 
the light and the presence of God. It's in our daily struggle and battle for transcendence to excavate the goodness and the holiness within the world that the ultimate objective of existence is fulfilled, which is why the Torah was given here. And which is why on Shavuos we begin with the cheese blintzes and only afterwards do we go to the deli part of the meal. Have a good night and a happy holiday.